Why is the winds of winter taking so long? It's been 12 years now. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel, we cover a song of ice and fire in nerdy depth, as well as the best in other fantasy worlds like The Lord of the Rings and The Witcher. If that sounds good, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. At the time of recording this video, George R. R. Martin has been writing The Winds of Winter for over 12 years, so what's been taking so long? I should start by saying that this isn't a moan about how long it's taking, nor is it me trying to defend him for taking as long as he has. So if you're after either of those things, this probably isn't the video for you. Personally, as keen as I am to see that book, and believe me, I am keen, I want him to take as long as he needs to get it right. I'd rather it be good than rushed. I fully subscribe to Neil Gaiman's response when fans were putting pressure on George R. R. Martin to finish the book. He simply reminded us that George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. Quite. No, what I'm trying to do here is, as objectively as possible based on what he has already told us, it's simply to explain why it is taking so long. Let's start with the obvious truth that George R. R. Martin has never been a fast writer. A Dance with Dragons took six years, and A Feast for Crows took five years. He was never slow, but he's also never been able to churn out massive tomes every year, like Stephen King or Brandon Sanderson do, for example. And as he has aged, he has slowed down, understandably. He's 74 at the time of writing this video. And The Winds of Winter is proving to be the biggest, most complicated book he has ever written. When he last gave updates on his progress in late 2022, he said that he was about 1,200 pages in, and roughly 75% finished, so the final product will be somewhere around 1,600 pages. That's massive. Of course it will take time. What is stretching that time requirement even further is that The Winds of Winter is not the only thing that he has been writing, or has written since A Dance with the Dragons. During these last 12 years, he has come to embrace the fact that this creation of the world of ice and fire as a whole is his lasting legacy, and he has taken it as his personal mission to expand the universe out from just that one story of A Song of Ice and Fire to a fully imagined world with histories and legends and death. Depth. In particular, since A Dance with Dragons, he has produced three novellas, The Princess and the Queen, The Rogue Prince and The Sons of the Dragon, expanding the history of House Targaryen, and then built them into two massive world-building books, The World of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood. Fire and Blood alone comes in at over 700 pages, with The World of Ice and Fire over 300 more. And then we get to the TV shows. He wrote one episode for each of the first four seasons of Game of Thrones, and although he was not involved in the last four seasons, he has been very engaged in the development of the spin-off shows. And when I say very, I mean very. In his own words, I have seen some comments out there questioning how much I'm involved in these new series. The answer is a lot, his emphasis. Deeply, heavily involved in every one of the new shows. This is not just a matter of him casting his eyes over a script every now and then. This is weeks, months even, or years of involvement in every project. And every project is not just House of the Dragon. It's the Duncan Egg show, which has been greenlit, plus the other shows that are still in pre-production and may or may not go ahead. You'll have heard of some of these. The Jon Snow show, 10,000 Ships, the Nymeria show, Nine Voyages, the Corlys Velaryon show, a Yeet-based anime. He has hinted that there are up to nine in various stages of development. There's also the Tony at Heron Hall stage play that's in development. While he may not be technically writing any of these things, he is involved heavily and deeply. In his interview last year with History of Westeros, he was very clear that he sees it as his personal role to make sure that each of these spin-offs sticks as closely as possible to book canon. That's a massive undertaking. And of course, there are his other writing-related commitments. He remains the editor of the annual Wild Cards anthology, writer of the Nightflyer stories, which were adapted into a TV show in 2018, co-editor of various cross-genre anthologies, a regular contributor to Worldcon, and much more besides. Added to that, yes, he is a man with many other interests. He owns a bookshop, a cinema, a railroad company. 
through all this time, George R. R. Martin has continually emphasised that he has been working on The Winds of Winter, and I believe him. I believe he is now over 75% of the way through, but he is also working on other things, so the time he has to devote to The Winds of Winter is squeezed. The way he puts it is that although we may want him to have only one priority, he has many priorities. All of which goes to explain how he has had less time than he might have thought to focus in on The Winds of Winter. But still, 1,200 pages over 12 years is just 100 per year, and even less than that when you factor in that he had already written several chapters of The Winds of Winter by the time he had published A Dance with Dragons. The Theon chapter, for example, which was added on as a bonus to some editions of Dance. So, being busy with other projects seems not to be the only reason for the delay to The Winds of Winter. And given the fact that he has written quite a lot of other things in the time, neither is him simply slowing down with age. Has he, as some people ask, got writing block? This is quite a sensitive subject for writers, so let's tread carefully here. George R. R. Martin has retrospectively admitted that he did feel the pressure of trying to keep up with the TV show, which affected his ability to write, and we should probably acknowledge his honesty in that. He was in a unique situation for a writer, having the world's biggest TV show relentlessly moving forward while he still hadn't finished the source material. But I do wonder whether the real issue here is not writer's block per se, as the combination of the complexity of the story we now have and his writing style. Let me explain what I mean by that. George R. R. Martin has repeatedly stressed that he is what he calls a gardener writer, as opposed to an architect writer. This is how he describes it. My stories grow and evolve and change as I write them. I generally know where I am going, sure, the final destinations, the big set pieces, they have been in my head for years, for decades in the case of A Song of Ice and Fire. There are lots of devils in the detail, though, and sometimes the ground changes under my feet as the words pour forth. That, I'm sure, works well for him when writing short stories or at the beginning of A Song of Ice and Fire. If something strikes his muse, he can simply follow it and let the story go that way instead. A quick look at his original proposal to his agent about the series shows how far he has allowed himself to stray already. Simply put, he doesn't have a story plan for A Song of Ice and Fire. The problem comes when you have a complex story already, with lots of characters, and then you decide to change tack. Any time you follow your writerly spirit in a new direction will impact on all those other characters and plotlines. Some may need to be rewritten, some future storylines may need to be rethought because a character unexpectedly dies, or goes somewhere else, or forms an alliance with someone. The person they, say, form an alliance with will change what they are doing going forward in the story, which will impact on other characters and plot lines, and so on and so forth. The bigger and more complicated the story is to start with, the more each change will have butterfly effects elsewhere, and A Song of Ice and Fire is already very complex. This isn't just me speculating. This has already happened to George R. R. Martin, in this very story he's writing. When explaining the six-year wait for A Dance with Dragons several years ago, he described the problems he had as various characters and plotlines converged on Meereen in this way. Now I can explain things. It was a confluence of many, many factors. Let's start with the offer from Zaro to give Danny ships, the refusal of which then leads to Karth's declaration of war. Then there's the marriage of Daenerys to pacify the city. Then there's the arrival of the Junkish army at the gates of Meereen. There's the order of arrival of various people going her way, Tyrion, Quentin, Victarion, Aegon, Marwyn, etc., then there's Dario, this dangerous sellsword, and the question of whether Danny really wants him or not. There's the plague, there's Drogon's return to Meereen. All of these things were balls I had thrown up into the air, and they're all linked and chronologically entwined. The return of Drogon to the city was something I explored as happening at different times. For example, 
I wrote three different versions of Quentin's arrival at Meereen, one where he had arrived long before Danny's marriage, one where he arrived much later, and one where he arrived just the day before the marriage, which is how it ended up being in the novel. And I had to write all three versions to be able to compare and see how these different arrival points affected the stories of other characters, including the story of a character who actually hasn't arrived yet. He called this mess of plots and characters the Miranese Knot, and acknowledged that it had been the cause of the delay to A Dance with the Dragons being finished. Might something like that have happened again? Are there any points in the story where there are multiple storylines all coming together at the same time, and that different characters meeting each other in different orders might drastically change where the story goes? Well, Yes, lots. To pick just one example that will definitely feature in The Winds of Winter, the Riverlands. There are lots of moving parts in the Riverlands. Jamie, Brienne, Lady Stoneheart and the Brotherhood Without Banners, Jane Westerling, the Blackfish, the River Run Garrison, the remains of the Bloody Mummers, probably Sandor Clegane, perhaps even Arya returning from Bravos, Nymeria's Super Pack of Wolves, the list goes on. How the story develops in the Riverlands depends on who interacts with who and in which order. If Jamie discovers the Hound on the Quiet Isle first, it will make for a very different story to If the Bloody Mummers Do. When George R. R. Martin had a similar issue when writing A Dance with Dragons, he took to writing different versions of the same story, depending on which order people met in, and discarding the ones he didn't like. If he's doing the same here, that would explain a lot. He's not just writing one story, he's writing lots of different possibilities at once. But even if that isn't what is happening, this is what it boils down to. The Winds of Winter is not an easy book to write. It's massive and complicated, it has lots of moving parts, and the story is now at its largest, with significant plot lines happening north of the Wall, at Castle Black, Winterfell, the Riverlands, Old Town, the Vale, King's Landing, Storm's End, Dawn, Bravos, Vase Dothrak, and Meereen. By my count, we now have 20 different living POV characters and hundreds more non-POV characters. The audiobooks actually hold the world record for the most number of different characters a narrator has to voice, so hats off to Roy Dutrees for that. Added to which, foreshadowing, prophecies and symbolism in the early books needs to start paying off in the later books. As much as George R. R. Martin is a gardener writer, he knows that a satisfying ending must build on the seeds he sowed earlier in the story. And expectation is sky high. I struggle to think of a more anticipated book anywhere in the world right now. When it comes out, it will be the literary event of the year, perhaps even the decade. Experts, pundits and casual fans will be lining up to critique it and compare it to the earlier books and the TV shows. The pressure must be immense right now. I actually don't envy George R. R. Martin at all in this. The first five books were so good and the TV show so massive that anything other than a home run will be pounced on with glee by many. George R. R. Martin is making progress, albeit slower than many of his readers would like, and he is very aware of that. But the reasons are actually quite straightforward. This is going to be a big book, bigger than anything he has written before, and he is a busy man with lots of priorities, and the writing process here is undeniably complex. As for when we will get it, sorry to disappoint you, but I gave up speculating on that years ago. He's clearly much closer to the end than the beginning, which gives me some hope, but beyond that, it's his book, and only he can decide when it's finished. Feel free to speculate in the comment section below if you wish. But to round off, let me just issue a rallying call for understanding. I genuinely believe that people will still be reading these books and marvelling at them for decades to come, perhaps even longer. We may be frustrated now at the apparent lack of progress, but that's just because we want it so much. We want to know what happens next, and I can think of no greater compliment to the author. But I think we need to respect the creative process here. The winds of winter will blow chill across the pages of this story, and then we will all be dreaming of spring. If you'd like to see more videos about A Song of Ice and Fire, there's a link to my playlist on the left of your screen now. Or if you'd like to support the channel, the best way to do that is via Patreon, and there's a link on the right of your screen now. That's all for this time. 
Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.